Yeah, tonight's Dave and Ed podcast, we have legendary Irish boxer and current actor, Don Duddy. Coming to us from an unknown location in America. Near you. We don't want to say where he is. Yes. All right. Rocking a cool beard. John, thanks for coming on. Yes. Thanks for having us, David. Thanks for having us, Ed. Absolutely, man. Cool. It looks nice and sunny wherever you are. I mean, nice. It's, 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 we've been very lucky. So we have, uh, uh, we've been on the road a little. We went up to Maine to visit uh, the brother-in-law and his wife, and we stopped and to see some friends on the way back to New York. And we've been so lucky with the weather. And it's just me and Grania and you and the people that we're visiting. It's only a couple at a time, you know. Uh, I mean, we're still doing the whole social distancing and being careful around certain stores. Sure. When you stop off at Walmart, you have to queue up like everybody else and stuff, you know. But uh, we're trying to make a positive out of a negative, you know, and, and, and I think that the, the longer it takes us to get back to New York, the better. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. Sure. sure. Well, thing, things are very uncertain anyway, you know, yeah. so yeah. I, I, at least you're having a good time getting some R&R, &R, you know. Well, it's nice, it was relaxing. It was out chopping wood today, so it was, believe it or not, we were out care, uh -huh. uh, clearing some bushes and whatnot and helped uh, clear a little viewway for, they just bought the, the this little property, you know, and it's... It's lovely. It's in a cove, so does Buzzard Bay. So it's 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 just really nice and relaxing. And as I say, just trying to make a positive out of this negative and, and not let things sort of get out of control mentally or physically. And yeah, and just as I say, me and Grania are spending uh, a lot of time together, and it's uh, it's great that we've been able to do that, and, and we enjoy each other's company so much. So I, I just feel so lucky. Mm -hmm. Great. Nice. Yeah. Cool. So, so uh, let's. We'd like to talk about your uh, formative years. Yeah, the early um, days. Yeah. Um, where Where did you grow up in Ireland? I grew up in Derry City. So I did. Uh, my parents were from the Craigan area. Uh, they moved down to Gaelia whenever they were expecting this guy, and uh, I had uh, grew up there basically for 15, 16 years. And uh, I've got two younger brothers and a sister, and. Uh, that that's that's where I, I spent my days running around, jumping over fields. They pass the checkpoint, get into Donegal with my bicycle, and go cycling and running around fields and forests and reservoirs. And and uh, I know it's a, I, I say Ireland, the Derry was a was a very good place to, to grow up. You know, very adventurous. Yeah, right. yeah. I, for our for our millions of American viewers, I guess we want to ask, like, could you talk to us about? The so-called troubles, or as they're called, the troubles. Um, that... Well, there's no so-called about them. It, it, it's <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah. Um, I have to. I have to say now, I was very. I mean, like, I, you know, the, the the years I grew up in the 1990s. You know, like I, I was a part of that generation that lived through the the peace process when put together Bill right. Clinton coming, uh, George Mitchell coming to help write that agreement, having uh, Ian Paisley and Martin McGinnis join hands at Stormont. I mean, I've I, I, I seen a lot of positive, whereas I think yes. my parents, the, the, the years that they grew up in the Craig and the no-go area, you know, bloody Sunday happened. Right. Uh, I mean, they, they were certainly more uh, uh, troubled times for when my parents grew up, whereas when I grew up, it, it was certainly still there. And even sometimes thinking back, uh, like bomb scares, hearing about shootings, and then you no, know, for me that was kind of the norm. But for my parents going to school, they were constantly being stopped at checkpoints and stuff like that. So, but uh, as I said, we came out on the positive end of it, and hopefully uh, it continues to be positive because I, I know since I, I was home last year and this whole Brit exit thing that's coming up, there there seems to be a lot of uncertainty about how they're going to move forward with that just as we're all having uncertainty right now with this whole COVID-19 and, and how, 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 the, how's the world going to be once this, once this finally, I don't, I don't know, whatever it's going to be, you know? Right. Yeah. So, so your, your dad was a boxer, right? Is, That's right. right. Yeah. So when did you first um, become interested in, in boxing? Uh, I, I, my dad, I, I remember annoying my father for many years. Well, many, not that many. I was five years of age when he first took me to the gym. Wow. And uh, I used to go and sit, in the, yeah, I was told to sit in the corner to be seen and not heard. And he would put me onto the speed bag just to keep me occupied. And uh, over the years, I, I was lucky. He took me to a little boxing show called a smoker. 
I was seven years of age and a, a young fella didn't turn up. And the, 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 the trainer looked at my dad and says, what about John? And my dad's like, oh, no, no, and I'm sitting. Yeah, 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 yes, please, please, please. Because I was doing a little bit of the training as well. Yeah. Luckily, I had a victory in that fight. And uh, my dad, my mum wasn't, <laughs> my mum wasn't as, as happy about it as my father was, which is understandable. Sure, yeah. So my dad, because I was only seven, he was like, you know what, I'll take you back when you're 10, if you still want to do it. And I no, and I no, I did all the other sports, soccer, football, mm -hmm. rugby, swimming, cycling, things like that. There, skateboards, BMXs. No, I, I, as a kid, I no, like anyone else, I, 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 I like doing things where I was uh, physically active mm -hmm. rather than sitting down and yeah, and writing or or something. You know, when when I was ten, I was asked to go back. I jumped at it and. Or something whenever I was a kid, boxing was something that I never had to motivate myself to do. I always just felt like this it fit me. And my dad asked me on a few occasions growing up too, you know, that I didn't have to do it, that I could pursue something else. But I was like, no, nope, this 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 is for me. And luckily enough, um, it ended up bringing me to New York and America and a lot of other places. Right. Do you remember that moment you found out that you were you were good at boxing, that you could like make a go of it? I, I don't think, I don't ever think I ever thought I was good enough, to mm -hmm. be quite honest with you. Wow. But I loved doing it. I loved the responsibility of being in that ring, and it all rested on me. And right. uh, I still kind of love that responsibility, right? No, in anything that I do, I love knowing that I took care of what, what my side of the deal was. And, and then, I, I don't know, it, it was for being such a young age, like I remember going to school and the teachers asking me, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I was like, I want to be a professional boxer. And they're like, well, we don't cater for that. I'm like, okay. So what? how about a, a fireman? How about a, a carpenter? How about an electrician? And I says, you can put down whatever you want. I'm going to be a professional boxer. Yeah, but my dad was, and my mom was like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know what? I, what I loved about boxing is what I fell in love with was it was the self-discipline, the respect, self-respect, yeah. respect for others. Never judge a book by its cover, um, and you can and you can cover all the bases in doing your work. I mean, you, you can hit the bags, you can do it, but it doesn't certainly it doesn't uh, it's not a certainty that you're going to win, as yeah. well. You know what I mean? So at, at the end of the day, you, you grow to realize that winning isn't the all of it. You know what I mean? It's 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 the whole process, it's the journey, the training, the going to training camps, getting yourself physically and mentally ready, and then whenever the fight's over, well, if you win or lose, not having any regrets, mm -hmm. not having anyone to blame. Right. No, I, I've never, I, I don't, I, I've never had anyone to blame in, in, in my career, and I've never, I've never blamed anyone for any of the losses that I've had. It's all been me, and I understand it. And some nights it was some other guy's night, and that's that's just the way it is. And and I like that. You know what I mean? I was never one for putting my blames on other people's shoulders. Wow, cool. But speaking of winning, you, you won your first title at 15, right? You won your first national yeah, title. Right. Yeah, yeah for, uh, down on uh, South Circular mm -hmm. Road, uh, the National Stadium in Dublin. I spent many years down there. Uh, and the first time I actually was in, this, uh, I, I got beat in the finals when I was 13. Oh. I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't get there. I, I wasn't even good enough to qualify when I was 14. But the second year I got there, I won it. I, and I won it at light middle, believe it or not. And I was that weight until I was 25 years of age. And then I, I moved up to Middlewood, which is the majority of my fights as a pro. But yeah, South Circular Road National Stadium, some great memories there. Wow, right. Yeah. And did you spend a bit of time in Cuba? I did. Uh, I was actually in Cuba with, it was the, the Northern Irish boxing team. So it was. And... Uh, they were granted uh, access to actually train with the Cubans. Oh. So they were just outside of Havana. And it was in, I think it was 1999. So it was an amazing experience. So it was, you know, um, you know they're, they're communists and whatnot. And in their camp, they've got little cottages. And in the cottages, they have their mums, their dads, their brothers. There's no every, yep, just because they're the fighters. So they're ba basically fighting for, for a living, you know. And uh, we, we made a lot of good friends there. There was a, a language barrier, but uh, in boxing, what there's a lot of communication with unspoken, and uh, we made a lot of great friendships. So we did. They had a couple of parties for us and everything. We danced into the 
uh, jazz music and whatnot, not that I'm not a good dancer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Irish, Irish. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, and did you feel like they had a high standard when you went to Cuba? A, a high standard oh. of boxing? Yeah, it was that. Well, that, that's all they did. You know what I mean? It wasn't like, uh, no, I say, I, 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 no, we all, we all have an array of options from where we come from. No, and, and some people are lucky enough to be talented at, at a few things. I was lucky that I was kind of not too talented at any other sport. But there was something about boxing that pulled me to it. And again, I still, I, I, I think the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, plus that I had about w w with me choosing boxing was that I, I'm a worker, I'm dedicated, and, uh, and it's because I believe that I wasn't the fastest. I didn't punch the hardest. Do you know what I mean? I had to work really, really hard just to be 100% to get into that ring. I know in Cuba, this this was just a way of life for them. And, you know, like even the shoes they were wearing, they weren't wearing, there was no such thing as Nike Air and Adidas. And they were wearing little plum soles and stuff. So even at the end of the training camp, rather than us bringing back all this big, no, because we brought a big bag of training gear, yeah. we, we passed it off to our, our sparring partners and stuff like that. And they were thankful for it, you know what I mean? And right. it wasn't even that it was... It was oh, oh, it was a training gear. No, it was normal T-shirts and tracksuits, but that's what you wear when you're training. Yeah. We made sure we got it all cleaned, and we were like, "Here, no, you can have this and the sneakers. What size of footy? There you go." Um, yeah, it was it was fascinating to see like uh, what was his name? Oh my God, we met him, he, he, the Cuban heavyweight. His name will come to me. Sorry, I'm blanking on it, but he was there, and he he Felix won the alone. Felix Savon. Felix Savon. Stevens. Felix oh. Stevens. Felix Savon. Sorry, Felix Savon. You're right. Felix yeah. Savon. And he was there. You know. Yeah. And we're like, wow. Like this is an Olympian. You know. Uh, this right. is the, the the crap. And and and, and no, he, he, they love with what they need, not what they want. You know. So that that was a nice little uh, e e education for us. You know. You don't. You don't need the bling bling. Well. Uh, unfortunately, today people seem to think you do or whatever. You know, I, I always, and I just thought that was a nice sort of uh, stabilizer for me. Like, you know, success isn't counted on what kind of car you drive or what or how big the house is on. You know what I mean? There's a, a lot more humble ways of going about it than that. Right, for sure. And uh, yeah. we, so, when you were a teenage boxer, up and coming amateur boxer, what professional boxers did you look up to and admire? Barry McGuigan was the first one. Uh, my dad was a sparring partner of Barry's, so right. he was. Barry used to come up the uh, uh, the ring ABC in Derry, and because uh, there was a few professionals there, Charlie Nash, who was my trainer along with my dad, and uh, basically, like I, I never ate my vegetables, and my dad says Barry McGuigan eats vegetables. <laughs> no Brussels sprouts, carrots, hey, boom! I ate my vegetables from then on, on. and I've been lucky. I've been lucky because. I met Barry whenever he won the world title in 84. I was five. He came to the Giltaw, and I remember him calling out my dad's name. Mickey, bring the boys up. And my dad walking through everybody to go up and see Barry. And then I meet him in Madison Square Garden. And I meet him at the Irish Consulate. And I shake his hand. I'm like going, hello, Barry. And he's like, hello, John. How's your dad? And I'm like, it's all true. No, it was real. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, that, was, that, was pretty, that was pretty cool. And, to be, and he was all, he was very like... Uh, you know, oh, you're doing great and I'll keep going and stuff like that. But I'm like going, that's Barry McGuigan. Like, because when I remembered him when I was five, he was a, he was a giant. Nice. All of a sudden, I'm looking, he's a fella with, I'm looking down on Barry. I'm going, oh my God. But I still felt like that little five year old, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. Well, do, do, you, um, do you regret not fighting at the Olympics? Like, I, I know, did you ever. Oh, the, you see, people, you, you have to qualify for the Olympics. I didn't qualify. Yeah, so, and to be honest with you, uh, whenever I was boxing, my heroes were Barry McGuigan, Muhammad Ali, Sugar mm -hmm. Ray Leonard. All my heroes were professionals. professionals you know, yeah. I, I never, I, I never, I always liked the idea of uh, my, my amateur days. As, uh, that was my apprenticeship, you know. And I always knew that if I was going to turn pro, I was going to come to America to do it as well. So, because when I traveled here in the amateurs, I was like, this, why, why is all the good boxers come here for? If you want to get better, yeah. no, you sink or swim, at least you'll find out. And luckily enough, I was able to swim for, for, a, wee, for a wee while. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. So right. You, um, you took part in a few amateur tournaments too in the U.S. before you... Before you yeah. Yeah. yeah, I boxed in a, 
I boxed in a, the first time I ever boxed in a casino, Foxwoods Casino in Connecticut. So I did, uh, fought a guy called Sir Coop Hoyle. We ended up being friends and Gleason's. He was a real nice guy. He beat me, beat me in points. Fantastic boxer. Um, and uh, but we ended up meeting him in Gleason's. What ten years later, or no, about three, four years later. And he's a pro as well. And yeah, and I also fought out in uh, Denver, Colorado. Uh, and I lost that one too. But it was just, I don't know. There, there was just something about being being here, you know, being in the states and seeing the training facilities and. And as I say, you watch TV when you're staying up late at night back home in Ireland at four o'clock in the morning. All the fights are in America, oh, yeah. not, you know, all the big ones anyway. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you came to America to become professional in uh, 2003. Is that is that right? Yes. Uh, you came to That's coming to a, So tell us about coming to America. Yeah. The, when you landed, the feeling. Yeah. yeah. Tell us about coming to America to be a boxer. To live here. Yeah. It was, uh, it was well because I've been here with the amateur team too. Sure. Do you know what I mean? And so the one thing that I knew, I wasn't coming here to be a tourist. I had already done that. Right. You know. So when I came here, it was like, when when do I start work? When do I start work? I need to start work. And because they wanted me to go, and the, people wanted me to go to the Golden Gloves and all. They checked me out. It's true. This I'm like, how much does the Golden Gloves pay? Oh no, it's amateur. Uh, I'm here to earn money. I was an, I, I'm, I'm the Irish number one. And I'm not earning a lot of money there. You think I'm going to come here and fight for... No, I need to be a professional. That's that's what I want to do. Um, I landed in February 26th. And I had my pro debut. I think it was September 3rd or something. And I got there that year. And just didn't look back, you know. Yeah. And, and your pro debut was in the Bronx, right? Was it? It was in Jimmy's Bronx Cafe. So it was. And, do you... and the main event was a guy called Paulie Malinagi. I fought in the undercard of Paulie a few times. He fought Miguel Cotto. So he had a great guy, Italian-American. Uh, I think his, his family's from Sicily. But yeah. uh, we, my first training camp, he brought me along to his training camp. So I had his sparring partner and all and stuff like that there. Um, I mean, like, they, they, were, uh, they were great times. Been on the road, like, you're, you're training twice a day, sometimes three times a day, you know what I mean, four, five, six times a week. Yeah. That's all you're doing. You're, you're you're eating is only fuel. You know what I mean. You're sleeping like it's like you work, you sleep, you eat, you work, you sleep, you eat. That's it's class. You know, it's a nice routine. It was a nice routine to be on, and I loved it when I was doing it. Yes. And then you got to fight at Madison Square Garden, right? Pretty pretty early on in your professional career, right? Like around. I the did. Yeah, yeah. I fought at the I fought at the garden nine times. So yeah. I, oh, I, tell I, us what the first time. Tell us what the first time. The first time. Uh, I actually, uh, was it in the undercard? I think it was in the undercard of Paulie Malinagi, and it was in the big arena. Malinagi was fighting uh, Miguel Cotto, and I was fighting Patrick Thompson. Mm -hmm. And it was the first, I think it was the first time I ever went the distance. I went eight rounds. But I remember standing at the end of the fight, like looking up, going, holy shit. Right. Muhammad Ali, Sugar Ray Leonard, and yeah. Jack Dempsey, and all them guys fought here. Not right. fucking here. It's like, wow, you know? Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. Awesome. So, so um, talk to us about your preparation before these fights. Like, um, how would you like handle the nerves and like the, the anticipation? And was there pressure on you to win? Stuff like that. Well, you put pressure on yourself to yeah. win. It's like any anything that you that you choose to do that you're performing, and like you know, you don't go in there to fail. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and the only I think the only difference. Uh, we, 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 no, like boxing or a, no, a, or a, a contact sport like boxing and all the other sports is, is that if you go in there and you're like luster, you're going to feel a hell of a lot worse later on that evening, you know, yeah. physically. And that's not, no one likes getting punched. No one likes, you know, so uh, that in itself, um, I really believe that uh, for me, like just being there, doing it, I mean, like, I, as I say, I had no excuses for any of the, the the losses that I know I had two of them like but I mean it wasn't about that I was loving the life of a professional fighter that's what I wanted to do yeah. mm -hmm. and I remember a friend of mine saying to me because it took me a long time to tell people oh you know I used to always say oh I do a wee bit of boxing right. and my buddy was like can't stop saying that I'm like what a wee bit of boxing he says John I work in a moving company he says I direct people that move people's furniture that's what I do. It pays my bills. 
what do you do to pay your bills? A fight? Yes. You fight in Madison Square Garden. You, you're not a wee bit of a buck. You're a fucking fighter. Right, don't, right. Be a, don't be afraid to say it, but oh. I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it's the Irish thing, you know. Yeah, what you're just going to say. It's, a, it's definitely yeah. 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 Don't, yeah. don't know. If I was to go home and be like, oh, I, I'm a boxer, they'd be like, get lost, you fucking entity. I remember my mommy slapping you around the ear or whatever. No, it's like, I always say, I got maybe they also, it's, it's a good thing, but it can also be a, a, a negative thing about yes. us because at the end of the day, they, they realize your full potential. You got to accept this is what I do for a living. This mm -hmm. isn't a part, this isn't, oh, oh, you want to try the boxing? No, I am, and I'm doing yeah. it. I was asked that whenever before I came to New York, uh, it was one of my old bosses, and I don't think he was being negative about it. He just says, John, do you really think you're going to do what them boys on the TV are doing? I says, of course. What do you think I'm moving to New York for? Right. And he's like, ah, you know, well, sure, we'll see when we see. You know. Uh, right. But I, I, no, they don't mean anything. But, oh, well, yeah. you're home over here. The home, and I don't really, I don't think it's, they're not being, no, people aren't being bad about it. It's just like, look, when you come home, it'll be all right. Don't worry about it. And it's like, I'm not coming home. You know, I, I'm going to go and do this. And I always find a fact, even my, my granny would, would tell me, she says like, like you had no other, I'm like, that's what I'm doing. And, yeah. you, and, and, and you do it. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, brilliant. Would, would, you, uh, would you celebrate a win? Would you like, or would you stay disciplined? Like as in, would you have a few drinks? Or how, like, would you? At like, the start, because at, at the beginning of your career, because you fight so close consecutively, a couple of weeks in between, you're always in the gym. But then whenever I was getting up to the bigger purses and there's like six and seven, eight months in between fights, after a fight, they go back, meet, meet your fans in a bar or your family relatives and have a few beers and have a bite to eat and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. you know. Um, to be honest with you, I, I didn't see any harm in that. You know what I mean? I did all the hard work, you know. And It's like people say, oh, so do you go off the drink and all, like when you're in training camp? And it's like, it's not that you go off it. You just don't want it. I yeah. mean, you're constantly exercising and training and, and you know every now and then after sometimes you know you get that submarine syndrome you're like oh I'm going off your head and the trainer would say what you want go to the pub have a beer relax go out and watch a basketball game or something and chill out one or two beers you know what I mean next morning you're up and it's like wow mm -hmm. I feel good so it's always it's, it's, it's a, there are a lot of psych psychological no psychological uh, whatever on it. you know yeah. what I mean it's all of your, your mind and keeping yourself positive because when you're training too and you're sparring people, like you don't always have good days. Sometimes yeah, sure. them guys are taking the head off you. Yeah, sure. Your job's to come back there the next day. You know what I mean? And sometimes, like, don't get me wrong, I wasn't in there to try and knock out my sparring partners because if you're knocking them out, then you have to try and find somebody else. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. They do it. Like, no, you use the people you work with. And, and it was just like some days you had good days, some, and then some days you had really bad days. And it's like, what the hell am I doing this for? You know, and and I, and, I, and it's like anything as it goes on and on. The thing about boxing is, is that it, that it's it's deteriorating to the body. It's deteriorating, you know, the training, the fighting, and 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 on the the side of no, like if you were like loving drinking all the time, you couldn't operate at that level. Do you know what I mean? And unfortunately, like you look look at the many boxers today that are from the nineties and from the no, the early two thousands, and they're not doing too good. You know, I met a few fellas and, you know, and, and they don't talk as quickly or as sharp witted as they used to be. And I'm like, I mean, there's still a potential for that to happen to me. Like, I, I did stop when I was 31, but it was always in the back of my head. You know, like, I, I don't want to be like that. Right, right. You know, don't get me wrong. Yeah. It was it was a great time, but I'm the one that fits the bill. I'm the one that's taking all the punishment and all the damage. And most of the damage happens in training camps. Because yeah. you're sparring and fighting all the time in a training camp, you know what I mean? So, yeah, I just you have, to, you have to look at it. Are you willing to risk everything for this? And, and for me, when I, when I was 30 and going to the gym didn't make me excited anymore, I, I had to stop and walk away and try and find something else they work towards. Sure. Um, being a professional boxer and being like in tip-top shape, can you talk about your diet? Hi. Yeah. Um, you, you eat everything. As you drink a beer. <laughs> <laughs> you, eat, you, you eat everything. But again, 
you have to look at yourself like a like a machine, like a Formula One car. Like you only put a certain amount of stuff on. Right. I mean, like someone said to me, they says like, no, Michael Schumacher wasn't putting on leather in his vehicle when he won the you know, the world championship what, five times or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, right enough. <laughs> so, and again as well, I like pizza, I like burgers, but you don't eat it all the time, you know. Yeah. No vegetables and salads. Don't get me wrong. If you were to be eating broccoli every day for the next for the, for the next six months, you're going to develop some kind of allergy or something. You know. <laughs> I don't remember any of the dietitians I I met with, or and they told me they says, John, think of the rainbow. Fruits and salads, color the rainbow. Change it up. Don't eat too much fish, but eat fish. Don't eat too much steak, but eat steak. Eat whatever. You no, know, do you know what I mean? And and you know, when as you're getting closer to it, to certain foods. It's, 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 it's amazing. Certain foods take so much energy to digest. So at night after a meal, I'd be sitting there out for the sleeping. And it's like, well, I'm not having that again. You know, <laughs> no, you, 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 you work it, you find it for yourself. But no, I know people are all on these mad different diets and stuff like that there. And like, I didn't even do a lot of protein stuff or nothing like that. You know what I mean? It was just like, no, it's on your food. You know, I do, even now still, I do a multivitamin, uh, emergency, some cod liver oil, and, mm -hmm. you know, there you go. Uh, but, uh, yeah, no, the, the diet thing, I always just, you know, we know what we should be eating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's up to me to do it. And someone said to me, wow, well, you're living in McDonald's, or you're living in New York. And I'm like, well, I can walk past a, a McDonald's. Doesn't mean I have to go on there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, well, you're an Irish man. And I'm like, what? Oh, I can't walk past a bar, Eller? <laughs> like, Come on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm fight. I'm the main event at Madison Square Garden next week. Let's go to the bar and get full. No, <laughs> chef. Come right. on. Go uh, uh, so, uh, yeah. on. Could you talk to us about that fight with Chavez, please? That epic fight. Chavez Jr.? Yeah. Aye. Chavez Jr. What's there to say? He hit me more times than I hit him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair play. Go, yeah, no, it was, oh, was it was it was a it was it was a unique experience. Um, I don't really, I, I never got to know him at all. Okay. I never got to know most opponents. I oh. got to know some. So I did, but uh, why? Why was that? They just didn't want people. Didn't want to. Oh, aye, some people just don't want they. They're not on there, whatever way that they prepare or whatever. And then after once it's done, it's like ships in the night. You never see each other again. I've right. I've had a few great experiences where I've met the guys after or even before the fight have, at the press conference, just having a little. Hey, how's it going? I'm John, the guy Mad Vanda. I fought him in the garden. Right. We went ten rounds. And we're at the press conference, and he sees a ring on my finger. He says, well, are you married? I says, not yet. But I says, my wife bought it to me. I wear it in, the, in my right hand. But any time she's out of town, I put it in my left hand when I'm doing public stuff. Because, you know, oh, I just got married two weeks ago. Sure. And then the reporter comes up and goes, oh, we got to do the face-off. You know, the... Yeah. <laughs> so he looks at me. He's like, he's like, oh, we'll do this face-off. And we're looking at each other going... And they're like, can, can you look serious, lads? And it's like, we're the ones getting hit. We're like, we're, we're the ones punching it. We're serious enough with you. Because <laughs> yeah. people, people want this whole animosity and, oh, I hate this guy. And da, 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 da. So right. I want to hear this here. So it's the 10th round. And I'm ahead in points. And he's a strong boy. And uh, you hear the last 10 seconds of the round, right? Well, Matt Banda puts his hands out like this and goes, Dummy, give me a hug. <laughs> I'm like, put your, put your hands up for fighting. And he throws my hands away and he grabs me, he hugs me, and he pulls me in and he goes, me and you are getting a pint of Guinness after this. <laughs> <laughs> and after it, and after it, we went, we went, they, uh, we were staying at the Sheridan, we went, they Rujo Grady's, uh, Grad and me, Hum, his trainer, and my daddy sat down, and we never left each other the whole night. We were oh, just sitting nice. talking. It was priceless. Oh. And it's one of the best experiences I ever had with boxing. He's just one of the soundest fellas. And even that, he was saying, he says, after the seventh round, I knew, I knew, I knew you had me. I was like, what? He says, I had you with my best shot in the seventh round. He says, and he says, what? When did you learn to box? He says, I was expecting a big scrap. All of a sudden, you're moving around, you're dancing. He was like, what? So he says, I caught you with a right hand the seventh round. 
he says, and he just looked right back at me, and I went, he's got it. He's <laughs> on going points, like, because he, he was a tough guy, like, but it's funny. After the fight, then me and him were sitting, throwing bike back pints again us, and it was wild funny, because a friend of mine from Derry, Mark Ahoon, he says, you four are sitting there, and the crowd is around you in a circle, and they're all getting closer, getting closer. And then one of us would stand up and go through the good little bar, get four pints again, and sit down, and just start talking again. Because <laughs> 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 the four of are just sitting there, oblivious, and everybody's just like, what are they talking about? What, what, what is it? Like, Dear God, they were just fighting each other about 50 minutes ago. Aye, aye, they were just in the Madison Square. They're like, and they're sitting there hugging and singing and everything. Oh, I was class. <laughs> So, That's awesome. What was it like? So, what was it like being like a, a box office attraction at, at Madison Square Garden on St. Patrick's Day? Like, what was it like being a celebrity, John? Yeah, C- celebrity. Honestly, it's it's. Uh, as a kid growing up, I knew boxers. Boxers were famous, mm-hmm. so people used to people say to me, even to this day, I have people come up to me and go, "Hey, man, you, you look like that fighter," and I'm like, "Really? Who? That Irish guy? Uh, what's his name?" John Dory, and they're like, yeah. I said, yeah, nice, nice to meet you. And they're like, what? I'm like, it's, I sometimes have to pull out my ID and show them. And they're like, oh my God, it's you, man, it's you. And I'm like, people say, does that not annoy you? And I'm like, as a professional boxer, I fought Madison Square Garden nine times. I think if people didn't know me, I would be annoyed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I, I was, I'm up, as I say, I'm up on the road on my way back to New York. And one time, a couple of years ago, we stopped off in a, as it a, a Falmouth, so we did. And there's a bar there, and I go on, and the bartender looks at me. This old man, he goes, oh my God, my nephew boxed in your undercard. I said, like, what? He says, you're John Dolly. This was like about two years ago. My nephew is, was a boxer. He says, and we all went to the Mohican Sun Casino to see that fight, and you were the main event. Wow, he right. says, I can't believe, what are you doing in here? I says, well, I'm on for a pint of Guinness. <laughs> <laughs> But this, here's this, but here's this random guy I've never met before, yeah. and hey, I'm telling you, he treated me and Gronya like superstars. Um, right. I, people, how how can you be annoyed at that? I don't I don't expect that kind of treatment, but when people just to give him a photograph to hang on the bar, that's like, come on. I mean, I don't know. I, I'm very lucky. I'm like, and that's the other thing. I was only a professional boxer for seven years. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and even going back to Ireland, I still go back to Ireland, and people are like, oh, oh my God, you're the boxer. Are you still fighting? And I'm like, that's 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah, well. But, but, they still, but they still remember, you know? So, no, I, I, I'm very lucky, and, and I appreciate it. I'll never go back there. But, uh, yeah, no, no I, it was a great time. I mean, I, I, was a, I, was a, I, was a, I was a comet, as Terry Atlas would say, about certain fighters. Mm-hmm. I was so bright and beautiful for a while, and then I just right, right, faded right. out. Yeah. <laughs> but you you returned to Ireland too for a little bit before you retired, right? You went you fought a few times in Belfast. I fought in uh, I fought in Dublin twice at the National Stadium, South oh, Circular okay. Road, right. and then I had one, and then I had a uh, one big fight against Howard Eastman in the King's Hall. Mm-hmm. So I did. Uh, that was about two thousand and. It, so right. was so I, st- I I still fought for two years after I was back home in Ireland. So that before I, I was down in Texas and Dallas Cowboy Stadium and all and places like that. Yeah, right. And it, any difference between fighting in Ireland and fighting in the US? No, no. everything. They've got AC. They've got air conditioning here. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yes. Yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Do you, do you want to say something? Do you want to say something about the um? Just wondering about the business side of it, like boxing, like the business side of it. And did you ever feel like, were you looked after? Did you feel like you were looked after by business people? Ah, uh, here I, I know what these are these are getting at, but no, um, boxing's a sport and a business. Very sneaky. <laughs> oh, he just called me. Don't mind him. He's very sneaky. <laughs> I'm very sneaky. Hey, where do I see you again? All right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but seriously, John. <laughs> but, but seriously, answer the question. I, I, uh, I, don't get me wrong. I, I had a lot of, I had a lot of, uh, no, time to think about how my career happened and ended and things like that. There, and luckily enough, it, it all got the. Uh, uh, I stopped boxing because of me. 
You know what I mean? Oh. There was a lot. There was some opportunities out there that I wasn't aware of. But at the end of the day, that was my fault because whenever I was training for a fight and I was asked to go to certain meetings, I was like, no, 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 you take care of that. I'm going to the gym. And now today, like you see, like even even back in the day when Sugar Ray Leonard and Della Hoy and them, you know, boxing's not it's not just the fighting side, it's the business. And I and I was kind of probably negligent on the business side of it, where I could have been more responsible for myself rather than dependent on other people. So at the end of the day, whose fault's that? It's right. my fault. Right. So I think of anything if I have to change anything that I would be a wee bit more uh uh, uh, involved in the 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 you know the contracts and the negotiations and just learning more about the the back end of, of the business. You know, other than that, there I had the fights. Once you get in the ring, none of that shit matters. You know. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, so then you decided to become an actor when the boxing ended. Well, I'm still trying to do that. No, you're doing it pretty well, no, man. Jesus not, Christ! No, you're not. You're not doing a wee bit of acting. You're an actor. But like, what? Just, I just wondering, like, what? Like, why? Like, what, what? What was in you that was like, okay, I want to be an actor? Where'd that come from? I was, I was always, I was always a, a huge fan of movies and stories and writing and music and I don't know. Like, I know, like, my my my, my dad was never anything of a no. And the literature and all I got there, but he went to plays, right? And then he would come and tell me about them, oh. you know. And my mom too, stories and books and sure, you know, growing up as kids at home, you always had to have a little performance to do in front of your granny or granda or your aunties or uncles. And if mm -hmm. it wasn't boxing, I was I was singing or trying to do Prince Charles or somebody stupid like that and make right. them look stupid or something, you know. And when I finished. Like when I was boxing, I had a few people talking to me about the idea of maybe you know, getting involved in it and stuff like that. And I was like, I would love to. I would really love to get into that. Because even when I grew up, or like in the high school I went to, like there was no drama class or nothing like that there. You know, there was and, uh, there was a few uh, projects that I got involved in, you know, independent ones that I, you know, that I was a part of, like an extra. Like just to be an extra, I was like, oh, this is great. Wow. And it's not, I know it's not acting, but... Uh, I loved that idea, you know, I loved, and then whenever I finished fighting, I did a play, Seamus McDonough called me up and asked me if I was okay, and uh, no, he says, why did you retire for And I was like, look, I just don't like it no more, I don't love it, I says, I don't, I says, I'm going, I'm going to get hurt, if I, if, I, if I keep going, I'm going to get really hurt, and uh, I'll be, I'll be over now, my dinner is ready, okay, oh, right, okay. <laughs> but uh, Thank me, uh, Seamus called me up and says, "Look, I'm working. On, I've got a play we're working on called Kid Shamrock, and yes. uh, you'd be great for the lead." He says, "We're doing it. We're doing an older version of the guy and a younger version. You'd play the younger version." And I was like, "Okay, so what's what's it about?" He says, "Well, it's he's, he's an Irish American. He's an alcoholic, and he's considered retirement." And I was like, oh, two out of three ain't bad. I'll, I'll have a crack at that." But I got to meet uh, some amazing people. And I just love the whole environment of it all. The, the no, the, the going to rehearse. Don't get me wrong, learn lines is terrifying. So it does, but there, there, there is techniques for that. There's things you can learn to help you with it. And sure. there was a, a, dear God, John. What's his fucking name again? Well, let's see. There was, a, there was all Irish people too. So it was Jimmy Smallhorn. Oh yeah. yeah, he's based in Dublin. I mean, Jimmy, 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 Jimmy. I remember just speaking with him for about an hour about you no know, the character and what what the guy is, and he, and he said, "Look, he says, John, it's your first time. It's great to have you on board because it was it wasn't too long after my retirement, so I was putting bums on seats, yeah. as they say. Well, he says, don't worry about your your accent. He says they'll forget about that. Just think of what he's going through. He right. says you never know, maybe some familiar you can tap on the and he just talked to me and I was like, he's talking to me like a, a cornerman, like yeah. a trainer. Yeah. He's giving me advice. Yeah. And it, don't get me wrong, you don't have to use it all. Yeah. And if you do use it and, 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 and it doesn't work, no, you can still find all our ways, but he's there for your protection. And yes. Amelda O'Reilly, she was she was working on it, helping writing it on it, you know, and I was just like, oh my God. And then 
the only thing was most of the cast was X Fighters, mm-hmm. Seamus McDonough. Uh, my God, and she, I seen Seamus. You know, I was like, I was only thirteen when Seamus fought, fought, fought a Vander Holyfield. Seamus McDonough looks and sounds better now than he did when he was boxing back then. Mm-hmm. You know, I was like, I was, I was like, how did you fight heavyweight? Sorry, it was. Yeah. That's fine. It's okay. John, I have a very important question for you. A very, very, very important question. Okay. What are you having for dinner? <laughs> What's up? What's for dinner? I ordered a, a, a fish. It's a cold fried sandwich with sweet potato fries. <laughs> okay. <laughs> talk, uh, go on, go on. Talk, talk to us about working with De Niro, because you worked with De Niro, right? I, I was, I, I did. Um, no, the work. I, uh, I worked with De Niro. I, I helped train him for Grudge Match. Right. Movie did with Sylvester Stallone and the stunt coordinator Robert Sally, that was uh, shadowing Bob. He was the guy that coordinated the fight scenes and stuff like that. So he he lives in LA. The, this guy Robert Sally. Uh-huh. So luckily enough, uh, he was asking, "Is there anybody in New York that could follow these instructions?" Because he doesn't like boxers or trainers training his actors because trainers are very insecure. And it's like, no, that's not how you box. This is how you box. But it's for film. It's not the same. Right. There's a different that, – like, I've done some stunt work and everything in the last couple of years. And it's, it's, it's amazing because none of them guys really get hurt. There's a technique there. And it looks like they're really getting beat up. And uh, so I got a phone call from Mr. De Niro. Um, we hung out. We ended up starting to train together. And, when, and, then, and then as I was training, I was working with him for about three, four weeks on my own. And your man just gave me instructions to, for what to work on him. And he had been landing about two weeks before they were heading to New Orleans to shoot the movie or whatever. And uh, But as I was getting, as I was working with uh, uh, Robert De Niro, he, he would start asking me questions about what I was doing. And I know when he would be talking about certain things, no different fighters and history and then stories just and, it was like, wow, he was just a real nice guy, very shy. He could throw a great left hook. I'm telling you, it's, it wasn't too long getting in, uh, under the, the way of things. But when the stunt coordinator landed, he took him on the pads and put him through a circuit. And he looked at me and says, brilliant. You did like, everything I asked you to do, you did it. And Bob was like, oh, yeah. So when he landed... Uh, I was about to leave, and I was like, "So is that me done?" And De Niro was like, "No, no, no. You keep, you keep coming." Even though the stunt guy was, he says, "No." So I ended up then, no, being the water boy, getting the towel in the corner, like it was a fight, you know, like he was getting ready. It was, it was really, really cool. And uh, let's see, producers landed. They talk about a movie called Hands of Stone, mm-hmm. and the stunt coordinator was like, he ended up. It was the same stunt coordinator for that. And he says, I, I, got, I got a guy here, be great for Ken Buchanan. And they look, and he said, well, we've already cast him. I'm just letting you know, this guy. So it goes on, nothing happens anyway. So they go away to do the movie. I get paid very nicely and uh, stay good friends with Robert Sally. The Nero's reached out to me a few times, you know, yeah. very nice. And then September of that same year, 2013, I get a phone call from Robert De Niro saying, what am I doing at Christmas? And I was like, uh, working on Christmas. And he goes, how do you fancy about coming to uh, Panama? They play Ken Buchanan. The actor just left. They do. They, he got a star and rolling in our movie or something. And uh, I was driving the car. Gronje's fist was like, <laughs> I was like, yes, no problem. And uh, I went down. They flew me down. They flew me to LA first. They do a bit of training and stuff like that. And then I'm back to New York. And then they flew me down. They, I was in Panama for, what, four weeks? Mm-hmm. Uh, last week in November and the first oh just before I was I landed back in New York the twenty second of December oh. and uh, it was brilliant and when I, no whenever I went to the hotel John Dory wasn't the name the room was booked on there it was Ken Buchanan wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's awesome yeah because whenever I was like excuse me I says John Dory sorry you know I'm like uh, I'm I'm with a phone and they're like really uh, they're all here and I'm like I'm like a, a last minute placement. Um, really? Oh, well, oh, there's a few names here. And they're going down, thank God Buchanan's B. Uh, and then, oh, Buchanan. Can I say, that's me. That's me. I'm Ken Buchanan. <laughs> <laughs> so in the hotel, 
everybody referred to me as Mr. Buchanan, the most fucking class. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. And what was cool about that was I ended up meeting a guy on set who was an actor, a T-Schreiber, called Elliot Hoffman. Yeah. And I'd seen him perform before and he'd seen me perform before. So when me and him buddied up then for the two, three weeks and just to go watch him work. And he did this scene, this, mon this monologue, and I think it was caught up in the movie. But it was like a last day of shooting. Everyone was ready to go home. And he, he was he was struggling. And they did, he did it like three or four times and he kept mixing up or repeating the same word or something like that there. And, it, and you'd see people are getting frustrated. And I'm just there watching. I'm just like, this is great. Like, and uh, he does it. And he does it. Perfect. Amazing. And the director's like, brilliant, no. Yeah. Jonathan Jabowski, he called and was like, yeah, this is great, this is great. Okay, everybody, that's that. Ho, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. And De Niro's sitting there with a hand up. And he's like, what's wrong, Bob? What's wrong? You want one more? <laughs> I, and you could hear everybody going, oh, you know. <laughs> hey, he did it a second time, and he did it fucking better. Oh, uh, it was so cool, and that was down by the Panama Canal. It was a really, really cool experience. And we went out for eat one time, and he, like, he's, a, he's a very shy man. And as I say, I, I'm I get good buddies with a. I I became good buddies with the, with a stunt coordinator, and, and and whatnot. I get, I became good buddies then with the other stunt guys as well, and they were all excited because there was a real boxer going to get under the ring, with uh, uh what do you call Edgar Ramirez. They, they just shot the Sugar Ray Leonard scenes before I got there. And she, who was Sugar Ray Leonard? Oh, sure. So yeah. whenever I come on, I come on to the... To the... <laughs> so I, I got my hair I got my hair cut. I got my hair cut a wee bit in, in New York before I went down because I knew what Ken Buchanan looked like. I have, I have a picture on my wall back home in Derry. John Francis, Michael Dory, Ken Buchanan. My dad got for me when he... My dad was a sparring partner for him. Like, okay. Well, wow. I knew what he looked like. So when I went on... They're all doing up Usher's hair, and he's like, "Oh my God, you, you're the fighter, you're the Irish guy." Wow, I, I really would love to hang around and see this. And all I'm like, "Well, you know, you can." I'm looking forward to seeing what you're like today. You know, <laughs> oh, no, but uh, they reckon they spent they spent they spent a lot of time on his hair, and all. Oh, he looked like Sugar Ray Leonard's back then. The, so I I go and sit down. The, the lady puts on a wee bit of makeup. She looks at me hair and goes, "Oh, you're fine." And I'm like, "What?" <laughs> 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 yeah. Wow. Oh, it was it was it was really cool. I, I got to hang out with some some really cool actors, and uh, we went to uh, uh, a Ruben Blades concert. Ruben Blades, he's an actor. He is so nice. He is so nice. Every morning I come over. Hey, John, how you doing? Chatting away. You're looking forward to the fight scene. We're all looking forward to it. You know, it was like a thing, and that was the thing I was told. You're not allowed to hit him. I'm like, I'm not going to hit him. He may hit you, but you're not allowed to hit him. I says, don't worry. He's not going to hit me. It'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was just, it was so, there was just so many great things that happened. And to be honest with you, I think I've got more great stories. Well, I know I've got some great stories with boxing, but it, and it could nothing to do with the fighting. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It's got to do with after it and meeting up with people and with acting. It's all got to do with the whole fucking process of it all. The process. It's, it's so cool, you know? Yeah. And, so we'll keep knocking my head at that and, 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 sure. see how, and see how it keeps going, you know. Tell us about your new film coming out soon, A Bend in the River, written and directed by Colin Broderick. Um, do you know when that's coming out? Yes, I'm just... Unfortunately, uh, before this COVID-19 hut, we had just sold out in Belfast, at the Belfast Film Festival. Uh -huh. uh, and on that same day, they, they announced that it was sold out that evening. They announced that they had a postpone the event so uh, I think like a lot of other people that are involved in projects everything's just been put on the shelf yeah. and hopefully hopefully if we get back to some kind of normal I don't know I, I think it's, it's going to be like Christmas comes early all of a sudden people are going to go out again and see this because well uh, and then again and the, and the reality of it all no we, we may never be able to go to a cinema to watch a movie again you know we just don't know Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's really scary so it's made. It's done. I've seen it. I'm, 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 I'm like it. I'm very proud of it. Being very proud of it. Colin's very proud of it. Um, hopefully someday we'll be able to share it with with everyone. You know. Yeah. I really hope so. Yeah. But uh, 
yeah, that was a great experience too. Just being back at home in Ireland for four or five weeks, living up in Alta Muskin Road in a wee cottage and all, it was just beautiful. Wow. You know? oh, yeah. I was going to ask that question, like, do you, ever think, do you ever think down the line you might move back to Ireland? I'm not sure, to be quite honest with you. If I could, if I could, find, if I could find work there. I mean, if I was back there being an actor, uh, yeah, no problem. What I did in Alta Muskin Road, I could do that all year round there. Do you know what I mean? We were doing long days because it was it was a five five week shoot, but we were still doing ten or eleven hour days and stuff. But you know yourselves, lads, when when you're working on something, time is of no, know what I mean? It's just the ghost it passes, you know. Yeah. Especially if you love doing it too. Um, but for the time being, me and Gronya are happy here in New York, and we're just going to, you know, like if, if, if this coronavirus had landed a week later, we would have been back in Ireland. Right, wow. right. You know, we would have been, we probably would have ended up staying there, you know, because they banned the flights for a while, you yeah. know. Yeah. So, yeah. But uh, yeah. it's going to, I think it's going to be interesting for a lot of us whenever this, for everyone, whenever this finally, we find some way to be able to control whatever this yeah. virus is. And, sure. Yeah. Would you, um, I, would you take the vaccine? What? Would you take the vaccine? If, no. No. Okay, yeah. <laughs> we, we're with neither, you. We're neither, with you. Neither would we. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fair play. Yeah. We can. I, I haven't. Hey, I only took. Know, I only took Tylenol when I had sore heads after boxing right. matches. Tylenol. Yeah. Nice. I, I don't get me wrong. I, no, I hit needle. I don't really hit needles. I mean, I give blood and stuff when I was boxing and stuff. But I don't. I've not, I, I haven't taken a flu shot in over twelve years. And I did that because someone told me, "Oh, you'll not get the flu," and I ended up feeling worse. Yes, and mm-hmm. I'm like, nah. Over here, especially over here, man. Everything on the TV is like pharmaceuticals. Every second, ever, wow. every advertisement is like this, 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 and then you find out that you can get constipation and diarrhea are the symptoms. It's like, what the fuck? Oh, and, and oh, and may also be a slight chance of death. Really? Oh, <laughs> that's, that's just allergy medicine. Yeah. <laughs> I come here, like, I just want, before you go. What what do you think about the current events with the? The rioting in Minneapolis and, and cops murdering. People. I have to, I have to, I have to admit these now. Yeah. Since I've been on yeah. the road, I've been totally off the radar. So Fair enough. Um, Fair enough. I only done, a bit of, I only done a bit of catching up on it. But it's like, it's like being at home and coming from Northern Ireland. You know, why? How are we repeating everything again? I don't, I don't get it. Nobody's learning a goddamn thing. Yeah. No. And, and you know. Like even today, there was a lady that threw a a, a, a petrol bomb at a, at a New York City cop in Brooklyn. That's right. Yeah. Like, I mean, don't get me wrong. I know there's a lot of injustices in the world, but it's like if we keep going on the same way and expecting different results. Yeah. Yeah. You know, but like it, and like don't get me wrong. I'm not that very political and stuff like that. There, like, but whenever I came home. Or whenever, wherever we grew up, once or something on the news, you know that that's on there. They occupy you with something else is going on. That's just the way it is. Yes, we agree. You know, and yeah. Look, I look at, and all I have in my control is to look after me and Grania, stay safe, keep, be safe for my friends if I can help them in any way, and and stuff like that, family and friends. That's all I can do. I'm not the person in the pushing the buttons or giving the orders, you know, but when you have someone that gives orders in, in the manner that he does too, it's like, am I missing something? I mean, I really do feel, I'm like, all of a sudden, there was people you used to aspire to be like, that you looked up, looked up to, and I don't see any of them anymore. Yeah. I don't see any. And it's, it's, it's heartbreaking, to be honest with you, because I loved heroes. I've still, I've got a lot of heroes that aren't with us today, but I still read about them and, you know what I mean? And watch old movies or fights and things like that. You know, it's like, yeah. Like, where are where are our heroes? Like, we we, we need we need somebody to be able to grab a hold of whatever's going on right now because something's coming. This is just the t- this is just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. You know, yeah. they've they've finally found a way to divide us, to divide us, and it's got nothing to do with sex or religion. Right. Yeah. It's not and it's not a war. All of a sudden, we're all in our own wee homes separated yeah, and yeah. i get it to social media and stuff like that but again who could be watching yeah yeah we're all very confined we're all easily controlled now a lot a lot more controlled than we were 
says me who's been up to Maine and now he's in Cape Cod and making his way back to New York. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, as I say, look, I, I don't, I don't have any of the answers. I don't know how, but I just know that there has to be something. There seriously has to be something. I, I just hope someday we wake up and you know there, there's someone else that could be like going, "Oh my God, where's where, where's that person been?" You know. Mm-hmm. Because unfortunately, I think if there was that person, they'd probably have him killed too, you know? Right. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Well, John, that's, that's, that was that's, 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 that's a wild bit of a diner to leave it on. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's art. That's, that's how we like to leave it. That's We're just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, uh, I mean, look, the weather is fantastic. We'll see what happens, you know? Who knows, yeah. you know? Yeah. Once we stay optimistic, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, thanks so much, John. Thank you for coming on, John, talking to us. Appreciate it. We're gonna oh, put- thank, thanks for my lads, and sure, I don't know, whenever this is going to be on, or... Yeah, we're, we're, thinking, we're Tuesday. Thinking Tuesday. Tuesday night. Tuesday night. Right. Good yeah, stuff. Yeah, YouTube, Spotify, SoundCloud, Luminary, and more. All the crack. Yeah. yeah. All the stuff. No Where problem. Yes. Shoot, go, on, go on, shoot me a, shoot me a link. Sure, no, email me a link. Will, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Good night, John. Great to see you, lads. Hey, and thanks so much for reaching out. Thanks, John. Thanks Enjoy your dinner. Us. Enjoy your dinner, man. Yeah. Love to grow on you. Love to grow on you. Good night. Peace. Good Cheers, man. Take care. Be safe. You Cheers. too, man. Cheers. Good night. Bye. Bye.